It's been 25 years now. The icy heights of Kargil had become the stage for a brutal high altitude war. In the summer of 1999, Pakistani intruders camouflaged as militants but backed by the Pakistani army, occupied more than 130 Indian posts across the rugged ridge lines of Kargil, Dras, and Batalik. What followed was a hard fought battle to reclaim every inch of Indian territory, hand to hand, face to face, post to post, and peak by peak. A quarter century later, the terrain remains the same, but the tools of war have changed. The question we ask is what if the Kargil War happened today? To understand what it meant to fight and win in Kargil, and how that battle would look in the age of unmanned warfare, we spoke to someone who's been at the heart of India's artillery establishment, Lieutenant General P.R. Shankar, retired Director General of Artillery. See, the intrusion was quite wide. It was over about 80, 90 kilometers, maybe a little more also. Right? At multiple points, they had come well in. Pakistanis had intruded to a point where they could see this road for a good about 50, 60 kilometers. And then they brought in artillery, deployed artillery, and then they started firing across. And during daytime, it was virtually impossible to move on that road. It was only at night time we used to move on that road. Now, the Kargil area is completely high altitude. Kargil itself is at high altitude. And we are look, looking at 13,000, 14,000 feet height. And these peaks which were overlooking, you know, the Kargil, Dras area, uh, were at about 18, 19,000 feet. And that's a place where oxygen is rare. You must understand, you know, uh, high altitudes don't have oxygen as a result of which normal movement is difficult. Then, you know, even your vehicles, they need oxygen. After all, uh, the engines need oxygen to burn the fuel. They don't get burned. So your engines underperform. You know, everything underperforms in high altitude. That's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is there are not many roads in high altitudes, in mountainous terrain. So it's only the available roads which you can build up on. And either side of the road, there's very little space for deployment because there's steep slopes and things like that. So it's very difficult to deploy in those areas, especially guns and, you know, right. So there's no deployment space. There is no, uh, you know, space to move. You have to bring in, then people underperform. People have to come. And when troops from outside or lower altitudes come into that area, they have to acclimatize minimum, you know, 10, 15 days. So it's not as if it took us a lot of time to first build up. That's why you'll see that when we came to know in April, May, build up started. It was not until June that we really started actually attacking and doing things. Before that, local formations which were, uh, you know, acclimatized did whatever they had to. So. Right. Then everything had to be done in the face of the enemy. It was open terrain. In those areas, there's no uh, cover. There's no camouflage. Whatever you do is can be seen miles away. So those chaps could actually see what we were up to. And so we had to improvise to put decoys up so that, you know, they think that this is the thing. And actually, very surprisingly, we built decoys at that point of time out of cardboards and poles and all that. It worked. And then Pakistanis fired on them also. And whereas we were able to fire, you know, uh, from wherever we were deployed. So uh, multiple problems out there. Then in high altitude, you know, weather is iffy. You, you, at times you get very good uh, uh, visibility. At times you don't get visibility. So when you... At, Times of poor visibility, you don't, you can't adjust fire. You have to see, you, you know, where you're firing. And uh, that's one thing. And then when you look from bottom up a slope, you can't make out anything. The chap sitting in the top can make out everything at the bottom. The chap at the bottom can't make out anything. You know, it's it's a matter of optical uh, sighting. So, so that's a, that was a huge problem. And... Uh, like I said, observation was a huge problem. We didn't know where the enemy was and locations we didn't know. We didn't know what was behind the you know forward ridges, what was the kind of uh, you know 
firepower he had deployed behind what are the logistics he had what are the roads the enemy had so whole lot of problems in high altitude physically i think the army was at its peak those people who were actually into the operations uh from a perspective we had bofors which was then the most modern weapon system air force didn't work there for obvious reasons uh, i mean we had problems in deploying it and our air force didn't know couldn't operate very well in high altitudes altitudes have their own problem so it was that so that was the issue uh yeah we didn't have satellites we didn't have uavs all those were not there communications were by radio and normal line we didn't have all these fiber optics and all that a few things we had at base communications but uh, nothing much more uh but this was consistent to that time right it was not as if we were at disadvantage for not having any technology whatever technology was going at that time we had then we said okay this won't get sorted out by just going uphill and assaulting Asphalt assaulting was a secondary thing. First, plaster them with firepower. So build firepower. So then firepower was built. People trained. People carried out reconnaissance. People then said, "Okay, this is the way to handle them." And we started hitting them with bofors, grad, one of I M M, whatever we had, motors. And then slowly, incrementally, we started, you know, decimating them. Got hold of the their. outposts at the lower reaches made them blind then move ahead and you know where it was a critical post we overwhelmed them with fire then at some places people went from behind and attacked them it's a mountaineering you know till assaults by you know the, all that so then that is how we overcame them then we said okay which other sequence first the people said we should take tololing and they took tololing and then tiger hill and then others also in other sectors also started falling so it was a methodical operation it lasted nearly a month war has evolved it's beyond mere boots on the ground today it's about what you can see before the enemy does and how fast you can strike from deep penetration drones to loitering munitions and swarm systems india's technological edge has sharpened dramatically since 1999 Now that evolution was on full display during Operation Sindhu, where indigenous drones played a decisive role in surveillance, target acquisition, and precision strikes. To understand just how far India's drone capabilities have come and how they're reshaping the future of warfare, we spoke to Tanmay Bankar from Botlab Dynamics, a company at the very forefront of building India's next generation of autonomous aerial systems. I had the good fortune of visiting uh, Dras last year, so we went there with a drone. Like we we took one of the light show drones that were there, the and we went to the Kargil War Memorial. Uh, the pressure is thirty percent less than what you have in say Delhi or Bombay. Uh, that environment is the first enemy. The person sitting on top is your second enemy. So again, if you have to go on top, you attract fire. you take a few casualties and then only you know where the other guy is if you have a few drones with you you can actually figure out where the guy is and again you can do it at night also now the enemy will not have the luxury of even cooking because as soon as they do that place is so cold that anything emitting any thermal signature will be picked up relatively quickly The other point is that in order for me to engage the other guy, I have to be in the small arms radius of the other person. Whereas, if you have an FPV drone today, I can take it through the window of that bunker. I will go for the firing port directly. The other point, if they have resupplies on the other side, I don't even have to take out the bunker. I'll take out their supplies first. They can sit there and do what they want. you can't fight without your supplies so those are the things that i went there and i was hosted by the army I, and they said you see that bunker over there that is where the northern line infantry is sitting 
like and my first thought was sir how how long would it take you to go up he like it takes us on, on a good day maybe 5 to 6 hours and 12 hours depending on how the slope is i remember there was tolo link there was batra top and there's tiger hill i could see the peaks and i say if i have a drone i can reach there in probably less than 15 minutes those drones are with us not us with a number of companies in india today and if they dare come today and sit in those bunkers they will welcome them very very nicely on this thing the other point i remember was uh, and this is quite uh, we were denied gps we were denied gps and, uh, and during kargil we have navic today like uh, a lot of the drones that we operate and I, i'm sure others also operate are navic capable now they can navigate the gps today will navigate off of our own constellation so technology has changed a lot has changed we have become independent as a sovereign country uh, and then i think static warfare was dead then they might it might give you an advantage for a small period of time but that kind of warfare itself is obsolete now you can't just say oh, i'll sit here now get me out we have better ways our terminal guidance is so much better we don't need 50 kgs we with 500 grams place in the right position you can take the other guy out so we have already talked about isr but there are drones which are taking up uh, replenishment operations as in it can take 20 40 kgs like normally a, a fully laden helicopter while it's filled with fuel how much weight can it carry less than one person's worth but now you have drones that can carry 20 30 40 kgs from one point to the other and you can resupply your guys using drones itself there are drones that are deployed i'll, I'll not say ki it is enough in numbers but if the need arises we can quickly send a few drones there have our guys resupplied help them in their fight and give them the stand off that is needed so they are out of the harm of the the other guys fire So I think drones is only limited by the imagination of the operator that is using it. That is good and bad because because we can use them, so can the other guy. We've heard about what happened 25 years ago, and how young officers and jawans climbed almost vertical cliffs under relentless fire to reclaim every inch of Indian territory. We've seen how far drone technology has come since then. offering eyes in the sky precision firepower and real time battlefield intelligence but what would all this mean if a kargil like conflict were to erupt today would ai assisted drones replace human scouts would artillery be guided by real time isr feeds instead of human spotters to answer that we went back to lieutenant general pr shankar to ask that if kargil were to happen in 2025 not 1999 how would india fight it today you have satellite imagery you have uavs right you have other ground patrols everything so the extent of this intrusion will be very clearly known to everyone where everyone is so it you can pinpoint your targets are very clear those days the targets were only clear when the chap fired at you and then you fired back and acquired those targets and things like that that would not be there no, you won't not only really know what is in front of you you would also know what's behind them in the river slopes where they are deployed where their infrastructure is where their logistics bases are where their guns are where this ammunition the second thing is you can bring in heavy uh, long range missiles through ladakh you air land them into ladakh and move them down south i'm taking the same setting of kargil because move down down south and all your long range vectors can be air lifted into that area and you can build up ammunition from the air so mm-hmm. your build up is going to be fast and you're going to have reach and you're going to have reach well into pakistan today these people are equipped with night vision devices they are equipped with laser range finders thermal images so you are looking at as if you are fighting at uh, day time so your ability is very good the next thing which is very important is today's guns have the night vision and night fighting capability up to 5 kilometers 
at 5 kilometers if you can pick a target and hit it and you have the sight sighting systems to do those, that so you can actually pick a target at night the gun itself can pick a target at night and destroy it the fundamentals of what happened in kargil uh, will remain the same the time will start collapsing the time will collapse because you know you can build up faster out there you can push in more ammunition you have different uh, sophisticated ammunition you know dearth of ammunition you have better guns you have better missiles you can start hammering them and you can start cutting them off and you the infant or infantry as a result can be bolder you can then you know also like i told you earlier you can block off today in re- the re- current realities you can block off the chinese right so i think overall this whole story will collapse and this it's a collapsible story in terms of time the time collapse is what you can you can achieve with modern gun systems ammunition and you know, planning and everything and you also network uh, and of course just remember that you know uh, pakistan didn't use air force then we also didn't use air force uh, we don't need to use air force even now i mean i i don't think we need to get into the air force at all with just what we have and we can get ahead you also have to remember we have attack heptop heptos even those you can use from air to ground so you have a plethora of equipment those days we didn't have all this today you have attack heptos you have loitering ammunition you have guns guns which can you know uh, take on direct firing at 6 kilometers it is awesome plus you have uh, brahmos you have pinaka you have smurch i mean the works so you are in a different time zone altogether now so i will just i will say if what took 30 days those days i think should we should be able to wrap it up in about 15 20 days